Well, it doesn't take a lot of searching online to know that musicians are continually searching for the good life. Tony Bennett, in his song called The Good Life, crooned this. Oh, the good life, full of fun, seems to be the ideal. The good life lets you hide all the sadness you feel. Or another song called The Good Life, the band One Republic sings this. Day turns to night, night turns to whatever we want. We're young enough to say, oh, this has got to be the good life. And I can't even begin to quote Kanye West's R-rated song, The Good Life. It's clear if you look at any of these songs, you can look at the good life lyrics, that we sing about the good life because we all want it. But what if the band U2 is right that we still haven't found what we're looking for? And what if God has come to us to let us know what we're looking for, what the good life really and truly is. Well, in John chapter 2, Jesus comes to us and lets us know only he can bring the good life. So we're going to talk about that and look, about that, look at that this morning in our passage, and I'm going to break it down into, into three parts. First, we're going to see the good life that we're missing. Then we're going to talk about the good life as it comes to us, and then finally we'll talk about how to live the good life. All right, let's start with the first part here. If you're taking notes, this is called The Good Life We're Missing. The Good Life We're Missing. So in John chapter 2, John takes us to this happy, joyful setting of a wedding. Jesus is there with his mom and the disciples who started following him in John chapter 1. But what was was normally a a very happy setting, uh, where families could celebrate a new marriage, quickly turns this bad corner where the wine runs out. And this was a big deal in that cultural context. The groom's family was responsible, financially responsible for the food. And so running out of something like the wine, I mean, that would be a big part of the celebration. It was such a big deal that it was possible for the relatives of the bride to bring a lawsuit against the relatives of the groom if something like the wine ran out. So the groom's family here would have been shamed, or or to use the modern terminology, they would have been canceled if the wine ran out. So Jesus' mom finds out, lets Jesus know, as we read just in the passage. And in one sense, you think about what's going on here. This seems like a strange story after everything we saw in John chapter 1. Because in John 1, we see Jesus as the God-man. We see him as the light of the world. We see him as the king of Israel. And at the end of John 1, we see this repeated phrase, to come and see Jesus, to come and see Jesus, to come and see Jesus. It's as if John, as he's writing this, wants us as the reader to come and to see Jesus as he really is. And so as we, we're kind of excited as we start John chapter 2 and to come and see what Jesus is all about. So what's Jesus going to do? Is he going to confront hypocritical religious leaders? Is he going to feed the poor? Is he going to deliver his first sermon? Well, he eventually does all those things. But John chooses to first write about Jesus being at a wedding of all places. But not just any wedding. John chooses to write about a wedding where the problem Jesus addresses is simply the potential shame that the groom's family might have. I mean, aren't there bigger fish to fry, bigger problems to solve for Jesus? Or is something else going on here? Well, something else is going on here. Think about what is a wedding. A wedding is a celebration of love. A wedding celebrates the good life of a husband and a wife coming together in this new, sacred, holy covenant. So a wedding is a covenant ceremony. You go back to the Old Testament and you see that God's relationship with his people Israel is described like a marriage a covenant. They were in covenant relationship together. And, and really the story of the Old Testament then is the story of how Israel was pretty unfaithful in this covenant relationship with God. But God promises to restore his people, referring to it like a new marriage in a place like Hosea 2.19, which says this, 
God says, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. So God is saying this covenant is going to be rekindled again and made new. And, and when you look at the Old Testament, how does God describe this blessed, restored relationship with his people? Well, one description that God uses to describe this future new relationship is that it's this age filled with new wine. New wine is a repeated description of the new age that God will bring his people to one day. Wine is a symbol of abundance and joy. Wine is an indicator of fruitfulness and blessing. It's, it's this picture of the good life that God has for his people. The prophet Joel in chapter 3 talks about this future good life of God's people being like a time where the mountains are dripping with sweet wine. So when God restores his people and brings us to a place of peace and shalom, he's bringing us to this place of abundance and blessing and joy, all of which are symbolized in the Old Testament by wine. But when Jesus came, Israel wasn't living that good life in its covenant with God. So just like the covenant celebration at Cana seemed to run dry when the wine ran dry, so something needed to happen in Israel's covenant relationship with God because they weren't living the good life. They were missing the good life. What about you? What good life are you looking and living for? All of us live for whatever we think the good life is all about. The most popular course in the history of Yale University was offered a few years ago, the fall of 2017, and it was called Psychology and the Good Life. And nearly one-fourth of the Yale undergraduates registered for it. Lori Santos, who's the psychology professor who, who taught the course, said that she tries to teach students how to live a happier, more satisfying life. Now, it's no surprise that the course caught on so much. A, a, a study a few years earlier at Yale in 2013 by the Yale College Council found that more than half of undergraduates sought mental health care from the university while enrolled. So one of Santos's main lessons is that the things that Yale undergraduates most, most associate with achieving happiness, like a high grade, a prestigious internship, a good paying job, they don't increase happiness at all. Here's what she said. Scientists didn't realize this in the same way 10 or so years ago. Our intuitions about what will make us happy, like winning the lottery and getting a good grade, are totally wrong. Now, I don't think we need the smart people of Yale to realize that a lot of our intuitions about what will make us happy are totally wrong. Think of all the ways that we try to find happiness today. We, we have more entertainment options than ever. We have more opportunities for our kids. We have more sports. We have more medical care. We have more ways to communicate in ways that are faster and easier and in many ways cheaper. We have more ways to travel. We have more education options. We have more services for the older adult population. And yet, we are such an unhappy people. Christians and non-Christians agree that there is a mental health crisis today. Why? Maybe because the things we are told to believe will bring the good life can't and won't really make us happy. And like the wine that ran out, we're missing the good life we all inwardly long for. Well, here's the good news. The good life comes to us. This is part two if you're taking notes. The good life comes to us. So go back to John 2. And Jesus he sees these six huge stone water jars. So each was about the size of a bathtub, if that helps for some reference. 
And he tells the servants to fill these bathtub-sized jars with water. So they fill them to the brim. Then he tells them to draw water, give it to the manager in charge. The manager, he has no idea where the wine comes from. So you can just picture him. He takes this, I'm imagining just in our context today, he takes this glass of wine. He smells it. He swirls it around in the glass. He swishes it around in his mouth. And then he tastes it and is flabbergasted. He goes to the groom and shares his surprise. Why did you start this party with $10 wine that's picked up, picked up from sheets when all along you had this $10,000 wine in your cellar straight from the vineyards of Italy? I mean, usually you get people inebriated on the good stuff and then bring out the cheap stuff so they won't know better. <laughs> but not Jesus. Now, what's this really about? Is it just about Jesus wanting to keep the groom's family from getting canceled? I don't think what th that, that is what this is mainly about. John says in verse 11 that this was the first of his signs this, that Jesus did. Now that word sign, that's important. In fact, John chapter 2 through 11, they're, they're referred to by most Bible scholars as the book of signs. They are full of all of these signs about Jesus. John gives these seven signs, it seems. And, and you may remember the purpose statement that John gives for why he's writing in John chapter 20. He said, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So these signs point us, the reader, to who Jesus is, his identity, and what it means to believe and follow him. I don't know if you remember back in Exodus chapter 4, Moses is told to go to Pharaoh, the, the, the guy, the superpower of the day, and, and he's supposed to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. In other words, let your whole workforce go. And Moses is like, okay, what sign am I supposed to give for this? And when Moses uses the word sign there, it's very similar. What, what indication can I give of the authority for my message to be authenticated, for my ministry to be authenticated. So God gives Moses this, these signs like the staff becoming a snake. And so here in John, these signs in John authenticate Jesus' identity as the promised Messiah. So if you're taking notes, these signs in John authenticate Jesus' identity as the promised Messiah and Son of God. And as we look at each sign, we're going to be asking what they say about Jesus. And to do that, we need to look back to the Old Testament and then forward to the new covenant that we have in Jesus. So, okay, so what does this sign say about Jesus? A few things. First, I mean, the miracle itself tells us that Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the creator. Now, we were already told that in John chapter 1, verse 3 where John writes, all things were made through Jesus the Word, and without him was not anything made that was made. But just think about what, what Jesus has done here. It's not like Jesus takes the water, and then he puts a little powder into it, like this alcoholic Kool-Aid mix, and then, aha, it's, it's wine. That's not what's going on here. There's a miracle taking place here. That Jesus changes the very makeup of the liquid from H2O to whatever fermented wine is, I don't know what it would actually be called, but, but to do that, only the creator can do something like that. And that's why Jesus can do it. Second, second thing we see about Jesus here, Jesus perfectly fulfills all the Old Testament laws and expectations. Jesus perfectly fulfills all the Old Testament laws and expectations. Now, why did Jesus use these big basins that are specifically mentioned as used for Jewish rites of purification? Jesus could have done this miracle all kinds of ways. He could have done it like the, the loaves and the fishes, if you, if you know that miracle, right? He could have just had, as people are getting to the bottom of their glass of wine, ha, the wine, the glass fills again with wine, and it keeps on filling. He could have done something like that, but he doesn't. That's not how Jesus does this miracle. He has basins used for Jewish pur purification filled to the brim. And what's the point? Jesus 
fully fulfilled to the brim the purpose of the old covenant Jewish regulations of purification. Jesus was the perfect man and the perfectly righteous Jew. And yet out of the old laws of purification, something new is drawn out. Something even better. With Jesus' appearance, the former age of the old covenant was passing away and a new age of the new covenant was about to dawn. But don't miss that it comes about through these old pots, the Jewish institutions. Out of the old, something new and better is drawn. And that really brings us to the third thing we see about Jesus here. Jesus brings the good and new life. Jesus brings the good and the new life. I don't know if you noticed what day John says this is happening on. In verse 1, John says, on the third day. Now, there's a lot to be said on that. I'm not going to be able to get into everything there. But at the very least, I want you to see that in the Old Testament, there is a pattern of God bringing about surprising new life on the third day. So Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac on the third day until a substitute was provided. God came down Mount Sinai to reveal himself to Israel on the third day. In Hosea 6, the prophet talks about God raising his people from the death of exile on the third day. God brings life to the dead on the third day. So here, it's no surprise in a way that Jesus is bringing new life to the wedding. He's bringing the good life on the third day. Of course, when we go to the end of the Gospel of John, this has even a a deeper level of meaning because we know that Jesus brings new life on the third day because Jesus was resurrected to new life on the third day. Jesus brings to us a good life because on the third day after his death, he conquered death for us. He brings us new life on the third day. Which brings me to the most important thing said about Jesus here. Jesus died for us sinners on the cross. Jesus died for us sinners on the cross. Now, there are a few key words in this passage, in this story, which are used like a hyperlink to Jesus' death on the cross in John 19. You know what I mean by hyperlink? You know, if you click on it, it'll take you to another page. A few key words that when you read through the Gospel of John, that will bring our mind to the cross. Now, what are those words? first word I'm thinking of is the word hour in verse 4. Jesus tells his mom, my hour has not yet come. And when you keep reading through the Gospel of John, you'll see that the word hour in John mainly points to the cross and the hour of his death. A second word is the word glory in verse 11 where it says Jesus manifested his glory. Glory here is the showing of God's power, his majesty, his honor. And in John's gospel, Jesus is most glorified when he is crucified and killed. So the words hour and glory both connect to Jesus' crucifixion, but, but there's one more word here. You look at verse 4, and it can seem like Jesus is being rude to his mom. He's not really, it's just, it's a hard phrase to to translate when he tells his mom, woman, what does this have to do with me? I mean, of course, when I read it like that, it sounds rude, but, but it's not actually as rude in the original as it sounds. That word woman, though, is used one other time by Jesus as he talks to his mom. And that second time he uses the word woman there is when he is on the cross. And of course there, he speaks with love and compassion for his mom. You see, John is putting all these connections here in this story. He's purposely making all these connections, these hyperlinks to the cross. Why? Because the cross is how all of this happens. Jesus fulfills the old covenant through his death on the cross. Jesus brings new life 
because of his death on the cross. Jesus brings the good life, the abundant life, through and because of his death on the cross for us sinners. Jesus can bring the good life to us because Jesus gave up his life for us. That's how the good life comes to us. So if you're not a Christian, this may be the most important thing that you'll hear from me today. Yes, Jesus brings to us a good life, but that good life comes through his torturous death. Why? Because we're that sinful We are that messed up from the inside out that we didn't just need some moral instruction to get our act together. We didn't just need an inspirational speech to turn our life around. We didn't need a new way to simplify or organize our life. In our sin, we deserve hell. So we needed someone to take our hell in our place, which is what Jesus did when he was crucified. And we needed someone to give us a new clean, transformed, forgiven heart, which is what we have in Jesus when we trust him. So what do we do? Part three. How do we live the good life? Now, if you're not a Christian, the application for you is simple. Believe. Believe. Start believing. And if you are a Christian, the application isn't that complicated for you either. Keep believing. When you look at verse 11, we see how the disciples responded. They believed in Jesus. And we know, again, from John's purpose statement, that that's how he wants us all to respond, by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And when we believe that, we have life in his name. We're living the good life. God's word is summoning you to believe that only Jesus can bring the good life. And that good life is found in him, both now and into eternity. So what does it look like to believe? i got a few scenes here that will hopefully, okay, this is what belief looks like. And we're going to start from the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 3. Think about Eve, Genesis 3. God was very clear to her, right? You can eat from any tree except the tree of knowledge. And then you have Satan slithering over to Eve, and he undermines God's generosity and goodness as he says to her, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. So what is Satan doing? He's discreetly questioning God's goodness. Isn't God withholding something good from you? Is he really keeping you from all the trees? You deserve better than that, Eve. Of course, Eve counters that with some truth. But still, the seed of doubt was planted. And God had made it clear, this is the good life. Eve doesn't believe that but instead thinks the good life will be found in what is forbidden. And so she eats from the tree of knowledge. Believing that only Jesus can bring the good life means we don't believe the lies that come from Satan, that come from the world, that come from our own corrupted hearts. We don't believe the lie that God is keeping something from us, God is something good from us. God isn't this stingy father to his children. What good thing are you tempted to think God is withholding from you? Marriage? Or a happier marriage? Kids? Or kids that fall in line with your desires? Health? Or at least a little bit healthier than you are now? And when you don't have those things right now, can you still trust God and the good life that he'll bring you to? All right, second scene here. Daniel chapter 3. Where we have these three Jewish exiles and they're summoned before the powerful Babylonian king They're charged with ignoring the royal edict to worship the king's image. And so they're sentenced to death 
to be executed by being thrown into a big hot furnace. The very opposite of what most of us would say is the good life. So what do they do? Here's what they tell the king. God can deliver us from the fire and from you, king. And even if he doesn't, we're not going to serve you and bow down to your image. Now what kind of boldness? Where did that kind of boldness come from? It came from believing that only God can bring the good life, not the powers of this world. A third scene. This is my heart a few weeks ago. Actually, it's my heart continually off and on, it seems. Struggling with anxiety. And this particular occasion, I was struggling with anxiety because I was anxious about there not being enough. I felt like I was running out of things. Running out of time to get done what I wanted to get done. Running out of money to get what I wanted to get. Running out of energy. Running out of talent. Running out of emotional bandwidth. Running out of focus. Just running out. Have you ever felt that way? Well, for me, when I'm like that, my heart gets anxious because I look into the future and feel like there's not enough. I don't have enough of whatever I think I need. I don't think this explicitly, but behind my anxious thoughts is the belief that, that God is withholding something good from me. So I go through the day thinking, I'm lacking something I need to be happy because God's too tight-fisted. He really doesn't want me to have the good life. Well, when I'm like that, I need to repent of the lies I'm believing about God. And I pray for faith to believe that only Jesus can bring the good life. And he does that for all who believe. One more scene. A month ago, Laura and I had an appointment with a genetic counselor at CHOP. We're still trying to understand the many developmental delays of our five-year-old daughter, Ella. The genetic counselor lets us know that Ella has a significant genetic mutation of this SCN8A gene, which impacts her neurological development. It's known for causing possible epilepsy, developmental delay, low IQ, muscle and movement disorders. There are only about 500 known cases, but it's not very encouraging. Many who have a moderate case of it, like Ella, aren't able to necessarily live independently when they get older. The impact is that severe. Ella has follow-up appointments, though only time in the Lord's providence will show the severity of how much this disorder will impact her growth and development and intellectual abilities. So how do we handle big potential losses like this as Christians? There's a lot of unknown. We grieve. We lament. We love. We pray for God to intervene and help Ella's development. We also pray for perhaps the greater miracle of our trust in the Lord, no matter what level of development Ella has or doesn't have. This is not the good life of parenting that any mom or dad signs up for. A lot of our hearts hurt the most When we think about our kids, if you're a parent, maybe we want kids and don't have any. Maybe we have kids, but they're so hard to parent. Maybe we have kids, but they have disabilities. Maybe we have kids, but they're grown and not following the Lord. It's in those most hurtful moments when we are most tempted to get bitter with the Lord, that we must ask ourselves, is God stingy with us? 
Or does God bring the good life in his timing to those who believe? The point of Jesus turning the water into wine is not that Jesus will make all your wishes come true right now. The point is that the good life we're all inwardly wanting begins and ends with him. The good life is centered on Jesus and our relationship with him. And Jesus, through his death and resurrection, is the one who makes it happen. And for all who believe, one day it will happen. One day in the new heavens and earth, we will be in God's presence where the mountains overflow with wine and joy and happiness and blessing. There will be no lack of time or resources there. There will be no genetic mutations or broken hearts there because we will be forever with Jesus who is the good life. Only Jesus can bring the good life. Do you believe? I'm going to give you a minute to pray now. To pray that the Lord would give you the faith and belief to look to him and all of who Jesus is and see him as your good life.